Without an inkling of doubt, I can say that you wanted to learn guitar to play songs. The classic story goes, one listens to a song that impacts them, one seeks out to learn guitar to play said song. Building your song repertoire is so rewarding, but it has much larger implications on your guitar journey. There are two things that make learning songs all the more impactful and all the more rewarding. And that's exactly what I'm gonna show you in today's episode. Hey TAC family, this is episode 308 of the Acoustic Tuesday Show, a show packed full of inspiration and fun designed to help you get more progress, fulfillment, and joy from your acoustic guitar journey. Throughout today's episode, I'll be keeping you in the loop with some acoustic news you can use, including two luthiers that I met at the Fretboard Summit that are making truly magnificent inspiring instruments. You need to know about these folks. I'm also gonna share with you some educational resources, ironically, from folks I also met at the Fretboard Summit. That's all coming up, but first, let's dig into learning songs, how you learn songs, and the two X factors that will not only help you learn songs faster, but also make learning songs all the more powerful. Now, while you're getting your guitar, let me just make mention that this episode of the Acoustic Tuesday Show is going to be extremely important for your guitar journey, but also for a number of other reasons. This show is actually tied into some future shows. I have some announcements coming up due to some life circumstances that I'll be sharing with you again on future shows, but just note, this show ties in with those future shows, and like I said, it's extremely important. Now that you have your guitar, go ahead and, uh, well, I guess tune it up, and we'll dig into how you learn songs, rather maybe how you should start approaching learning songs. Like I said at the beginning of the show, you likely got into guitar to learn how to play songs. We all did, and there's great benefit from learning songs. Building your song repertoire is extremely rewarding, and it's very, very fun. Uh, songs give you something to play. When somebody asks you, hey, do you play guitar? You can sit down and play a song for them. Also, it gives you a clear outcome. Instead of just wandering around playing random things, you actually have a clear outcome, an endpoint when you sit down and work on a song. And it provides actual musical context for you in your guitar journey. You can see how things work. You can see how things lay out in song form. And then maybe use those to write your own songs or work on other songs. Now today, I want to go over two things that you need to do when it comes to learning songs. Two X factors that make learning songs more powerful, that make learning songs easier, that make learning songs more fun. But first, we need a model song. And I thought it'd be really awesome to take a look at the Big Bill Brunzi song, Hey Hey. This is a song that I've enjoyed learning. This is a song I continue to learn. So I wanted to kind of, well, walk you through my process. And it actually exposes the first thing that makes learning songs way more fun and way more rewarding. But first, in case you haven't heard the song, here's the Big Bill Brunzi song, Hey Hey. <laughs> rad song, right? It's a song that I've loved playing. It's a song that I've loved learning. It's a song that I love continuing to learn because there's so many facets to it. And it looks pretty darn complicated, right? Well, that brings me to the first X factor when it comes to you learning songs and getting the most out of them. And that is breaking the song down into its five essential skills. Technique, guitar licks, improvisation, rhythm guitar, and chord transitions. Now this may sound familiar if you've watched the Acoustic Tuesday show for any length of time, because every single week I introduce to you what the TAC family is working on. Acoustic Tuesday happens on a Tuesday, and it just so happens on Tuesdays the TAC family works on a guitar lick. And I always say that the TAC family rotates through these five essential skills. See, every single week within Tony's Acoustic Challenge, we break a model song down into the five essential skills. 
and it is vital for that particular song, but it's also vital for your general guitar playing skill set. So that's exactly what I'm going to walk you through today. So we look at this song, Hey Hey by Big Bill Brunzi, and we think, wow, that must be really fun to learn. I'm going to go from not knowing it to playing that version. Eh, wrong. This is where a lot of guitar players stumble and ultimately give up learning songs because you start to try and play that song note for note and you realize, whoa, a lot of, a lot of moving parts here. I don't think I'm going to continue this. I don't think I'm good enough for this. That's not true. You make the song work for you. You don't work for the song, meaning you don't have to play it in its end version. And the beautiful thing is, is when you break the song down into the five essential skills, you actually give yourself some working parts so you can play the song at a level that works for you right now. Well, of course, working towards that complete version, but it gives you kind of some intermediary steps. So first, let's look at the technique of this song. And for me, there's a couple of different techniques that we could cite here. Uh, there's a dead thumb, kind of a muted thumb with some really punchy finger picking kind of strumming going on. Maybe not strumming, more of a pluck. There's slides, there's bends, but I want to focus on the foundational one, and that is that dead thumb. So how I would break this song down, how I would work on its technique is I would hold an E chord and I would just focus on my picking hand. I would start with just that dead thumb, that muted dead thumb, nice steady beat. And then I would add a pinch. Now it doesn't seem like much and it's really not. But again, we're breaking the song down into pieces, focusing on the foundational technique. This underlies almost the entire song, pretty much the entire song. As I get comfortable with that basic thumb and the pinch, I would move on to a more punchy pinch that kind of adds some syncopation. And then I would graduate to kind of the final version with this, uh, with the full syncopation. And that would sound like this. Right? So there we took the basic technique and we started with the most simple part, the dead thumb. Then we move to the pinch, then we move to a more punchy pinch, and then we move to that full syncopation. That underlies the entire song. And it's actually going to play a huge role in how we approach the rhythm guitar component of this song. Now, the next skill that we're going to break the song into is its guitar licks, are its guitar licks. And there's two of them that I want to cite. The first is the turnaround, and the second is that slide up the neck. So let me go ahead and play that for you, and then I'm going to show you why this is so important, not just to this song, not just as it pertains to this song. So here's the, the lick that I would have you work on, or the lick that, well, I worked on when I was breaking this song down. Sounds like this. It's a piece of the song, right? It's not the entire thing, but it's a very signature part of the song. And if you look at any song out there, it likely has a signature lick of sorts. Now, you might think to yourself, okay, well, yeah, that's the signature part of the song. It only applies to this song. And that's where folks go wrong again because these licks will pop up in other songs, okay? Uh, namely, the turnaround. This turnaround. <laughs> It's in a ton of blues songs. You can use it in a ton of blues songs. In the key of E, that could be your go-to turnaround. So it's not just in Hey Hey by Big Bill Brunzi. This part right here, uh, whoops. Right, that seems like it's isolated to this song. It's also in the John Fahey song, Last Steam Engine Train, or something similar to it. That sounds like this. I'm not going to play the whole song, but you get the idea. It's very similar. You're approaching that slide. You're approaching that note in a slide. You're doing a bend, right? So when you learn a guitar lick from a song, when you break down a song into these five essential skills, don't treat the guitar lick as isolated to that song. It will likely pop up in many, many other songs. The next skill we break the song down into is improvisation. Now, this is a little bit different. It takes, it takes kind of getting in a helicopter and looking at the song as a whole. 
but not necessarily learning the song note for note. In fact, it doesn't involve learning the song note for note at all. It involves identifying the key to the song, identifying its basic chord progression, and then learning to improvise over it. So for a song like this, I'd say, okay, it's in the key of E. It's a blues song, so I'd use like a blues or an E minor pentatonic scale. So then I would identify the scales that I could use, something like this. Or a different, a different shape. Or a different shape. Or a different shape. Or a different shape. Right, there's a lot of different options, but starting to look at songs with this as a piece of them is really important because if it ever comes up in a jam, if you ever wanna just record a backing track for yourself and start messing around with improvisation, it is a necessary component. And it really helps you interact with the song on a completely different level. The fourth skill is rhythm guitar. And for this, you might think, okay, well, I guess I, that's learning it note for note. No, we go back to the technique. We look at the foundation and we look at the basic chords. This is essentially a 12 bar blues. Yeah, it sounds a lot fancier, but essentially it's a 12 bar blues. So I would take an E chord, or I would actually use an E7 for this because it sounds more bluesy and it's a little bit more fun to play. I would take an E7, I would take an A7, I would take a B7. And I would just use that basic foundational technique and I'd play through the chord progression. That would sound like this. That is the magic because now you have a working version of the song. I'm not saying you pick it up like that. I'm saying that when you start to look at the isolated skills that are involved in the song, you can create a version that matches where you're at. Maybe you didn't get that technique. Maybe that technique is foreign to you and you still have to work on it. Fine, just strum the chords. It doesn't have to be complicated, but we do have to identify some steps that allow us to continue to progress through the song. So we can play the song wherever we're at, and then ultimately we can add more things to it to spice it up and, and approach that quote unquote complete version. I guess in my mind, a song is never complete. There's always ways that you can modify it. There's always ways that you can refine it to suit your style or really how you wanna play it. The final skill is chord transitions. Now. Ironically enough, the guitar licks that we identified in the guitar lick skill are used within the song as chord transitions. So I'm gonna set those aside for a second, but think of chord transitions, think of chord transitions as a way to dress up what you're playing. And specifically, I wanna cite this A7 and this B, B7 rather. Um, those allow us, those give us some opportunities, those open up some opportunities for us to add some flourish that aid in the chord transitions. It could be as simple as a slide into a chord. It could be as simple as adding some notes and taking them away. So instead of just playing the chords, Instead of just doing that, and again, there's nothing wrong with that, when we look at the chord transition element, we're looking at ways to dress that up. So if I was to dress it up, I'd, have some, I'd add some slides and some pull-offs, and it would sound something like this. Right? All of a sudden, we have this, this really cool, catchy, interesting thing, and we're not doing all that much different. Again, it sounds like this. through that transition and at the end that is a turnaround that brings us back to that E chord. So as you can see, breaking a song down into its five essential skills is necessary to learn the song in steps, to parse it out so that all of a sudden it doesn't seem like this monumental task. But the big piece of breaking a song down into its five essential skills 
is allowing you to take those skills and apply them to other songs. You wanna learn another thumpy blues song? You've got a wonderful skill set to start off on. So it would actually make learning the next song that much easier. You're, you're, already, you're building on an already established foundation. So that's the first X factor, breaking a song down into its five essential skills. And really, that's why that has been the foundation of Tony's Acoustic Challenge. It really helps. It's helped a ton of members. I hear it and I see the comments every single day. The second X factor is context. Okay, and I'm using this specific song as an example because when I first learned it, I thought that's a really cool finger picking song. I'm gonna learn it. And it is, it is. There's no doubt about it that it is. But when I started digging into the history of Big Bill Brunzi, when I started digging into his style, when I started understanding his life, when the song came out, where he played it, why he played it, who he was associated with, all of a sudden, this song elevated in importance to me. All of a sudden, this song was way cooler than just a finger-picking song. So that second X factor is context. When you're learning a song, learn it for the skills you are acquiring, but also dig into it a little bit deeper. I think it starts to hold a very different meaning in your brain, and it actually translates into how you play it and almost the, the meaning behind when you play it, right? And I, I again, use this song specific, as a specific example because I learned it, it was cool. Then I went to the Old Town School of Folk Music, most recently for the Fretboard Summit. I got to play Big Bill Brunzi's guitar, which was a moment, and all of a sudden I was like, in this world of Big Bill Brunzi. I started reading the, the Bob Reisman book. Um, I think it's Feels So Good. It's, it's kind of a biography of Big Bill Brunzi and all of a sudden, not only playing his guitar and understanding about Big Bill Brunzi, it just brought new life to this song. It, it got me excited about it. So that's one of the things I want you to do when you're learning a song. Dig into a little bit. You don't have to go full hog. You can go into, you know, just as far as when was it released? Was it a top Billboard song? Why was it released? When was it recorded? Little things like that that start to add some context and some, some color to the song that maybe you didn't have before. So uh, with that, I wanna ask you, in the comments below, just let me know, let me know, <laughs> let me know. In the comments below, let me know a song that maybe you've worked on or that you want to play and make sure it's a song that means a lot to you. So let me know the song you wanna work on or have been working on and why you're working on it. And maybe it has to do with its context. And also, I'm very curious as to if this five essential skills approach, me going through this song, has helped you and if you can see yourself using it in the future. Again, make sure to let me know in the comments below. Now let's, uh, let's set up the studio for some acoustic news you can use. Time for your first dose of acoustic news you can use, and we're gonna kick things off with a luthier that I met at the Fretboard Summit. And I have a really awesome story. I actually have a couple stories about this particular luthier. But first, let's dig into the luthier and the instruments that they make. David Flamang out of Iowa. If you have not heard his guitars before, get ready to have your socks blown clear off your feet. Um, I talked to David actually at length there at the show and played a number of the instruments he had brought. And wow, just wow. Um, I, I have to say that in terms of a traditional builder, he has the recipe figured out. Um, but even aside from the instruments that he makes, he is one of the most kind and generous human beings I've ever met. Uh, not only generous with his time, but generous with the information that he shared with me. And also, I uh, ended up going out to breakfast with him after the show. My son Aiden and I popped into this restaurant. We sat down and David and his wife, Jenny, I believe her name is, pretty sure. I'm not awesome with names, but I'm trying harder. Uh, so David and Jenny sat down with us for breakfast and we just shared an awesome meal. We didn't necessarily talk about guitars. We talked about life and all sorts of great stuff, but uh, wonderful people and wonderful instruments. So let's look at some of David's creations. First, we're gonna check out a J30 with Honduran mahogany back and sides and a torrified red spruce top. Get ready because your ears, well, they, they might not be ready for this. This is a very complete instrument. Wow, wow, wow. And I actually have an interesting story about a guitar just like this that David had at the show. But first, you gotta hear this. This is a Flamang J30.
Okay, so now that you've heard that Flamang J30, I have to share with you a story about a guitar very similar to it. I was at the Fretboard Summit and David had a J35 there. I played that guitar for probably 45 minutes. I actually pulled it out of the uh, exhibition hall into a uh, more secluded, quiet area. And I really started to bond with this guitar. Like to the degree that my son Aiden was there with me and I was kind of looking at him as he was being so very patient with me because I was given this guitar the full rundown. I mean, I was flat picking on it. I was finger picking on it, the whole deal. And in my mind, I'm like, holy smokes, I'm about to buy this guitar. I'm literally going to buy this guitar. Um, I didn't expect to purchase a guitar at the show. I wasn't even really looking for a guitar, but this guitar just smacked me in the face. It was one of those ones where you strum it and you're like, you have that feeling, you're like, I this, this is, this is for me. This was built for me. So I'm sitting out there playing it and I'm just starting to come to terms with the fact that yes, I'm gonna purchase this guitar. Well, down the hall walks JP Cormier, whom you're likely familiar on YouTube. He's a phenomenal player up in Canada um, and just a great personality. I met him for the first time at the show and we hung out actually quite a number of times and it was like old friends getting together. So JP comes walking down the hall and he says, how do you like my guitar? And I was like, what? And he said, yeah, I just bought that. And I was like, I've never hated somebody and been so happy for somebody at the same time. I've never had that feeling. I had that feeling that day. I was so happy for JP. He's such a monstrous player. And in his hands, the guitar sounded incredible. But I was also like, you son of a... You son of a... Um, it was a really cool moment. Uh, just, you know... Person, personally and just also kind of in the guitar community. It was really cool. Um, so sad to see that one go, but very happy for JP uh, since, like I said, he's just a monster player. So make sure to check out his channel. Make sure to check out his playing and his albums. But uh, man, this was like one of those ones that got away. I never even owned it, but it was the one that got away. Anyways, uh, let's listen to another guitar that I actually played at the show. It's not this very guitar, but the same model. It is an L35. So think of like Gibson L00, but built chef's kiss. Chef's kiss built. I don't even know if that's the right description. Doesn't matter. This guitar is awesome. The guitar I played at the show, the L35 I played at the show was awesome. In looks, in tone, it had it all. Now you get to hear it. One more builder that left an impression on me at the Fretboard Summit. Now, this is not a list of all the builders that left an impression on me. Uh, there were quite a few, but some really just kind of hit me and, and, and struck me in my core. Uh, the next one, Michael Kennedy of, I believe, Montreal, Canada. A really nice, kind human also. Um, but uh, he had two guitars on display, and I was just like, you know, just shocked. Shocked at, at how incredible some of these instruments are. Not just Michael's, but of all the guitars I played, uh, Michael's definitely stood out. Um, and that's saying a lot because I played a lot of damn good instruments. I want you to listen to a few of Michael's guitars. These are aesthetically beautiful and he has these wonderful little touches that I should, I should mention because you won't see them in the video. The one that stands out 
uh, he has a he has a ported side, so a sound hole or a port, so you can actually hear the guitar from the player's side. Uh, we had an interesting discussion on that and how that affects tone. But the thing that stood out to me the most, and this is really silly that it stood out, but the truss rod access for his guitars is in the headstock, and he has recessed the um, cavity for the truss rod and built a magnetic cover, so you don't even see it. In fact, I didn't. I thought the truss rod was accessed on the inside of the body, and they said, "No, no, no, it's up here." And he just pushed this little this little piece of wood, and pop, out it came, and there was the truss rod right there. I thought it was really cool, um, a great touch, a great aesthetic touch. But you got to hear these things. I mean, they are they are something to behold. Uh, so let's first listen to a concert model with Sinker Cedar on the top and Crelicam Ebony on the back and sides, played by none other than Dustin Furlow. Here it is. <laughs> Let's listen to another concert model with a different wood combination. This one has a black limba on the back and sides and a Lutz spruce top. Um, this demo is brought to you by North American Guitar. Lindsay is playing the guitar. She plays it oh so well. She plays to the strengths of this instrument. And um, a very different tone set than the one that you just heard. So it's really cool to see how one builder can make two different guitars that sound very, very different, but still have this wonderful uh, lush tone. Uh, so here is that concert guitar. And um, just, again, just prepare your ears. It's, it's gonna be a great experience. Here it is. <laughs> Now it's time to see what the TAC family is working on today. Every single week within Tony's Acoustic Challenge, the TAC family rotates through the five essential skills that help you learn songs faster. That should sound familiar to you right now. You should actually have a lot more context as to why every single week within Tony's Acoustic Challenge, we focus on these five essential skills. On Monday, the TAC family works on a technique challenge, Tuesdays, a guitar lick challenge, Wednesdays, an improvisation challenge, Thursdays, a rhythm guitar challenge, and Fridays, a chord transition challenge. Today is Tuesday, they are working on a guitar lick, and here it is. Your Tuesday TAC Guitar Lick Challenge is named Gone Too Long because it's pulled from the Bill Withers song, Ain't No Sunshine. It's actually the melody from that song. Now you might not usually associate melody with a guitar lick, but I guess in my world, I associate the two very much because to me, there's no better guitar lick to play during a solo than the melody of the song. It truly honors the song. It gives a little bit of reverence to what the singer's singing. And usually the melody is the most catchy part. So why wouldn't you base your guitar solo around that or maybe a portion of a guitar lick? Let me go ahead and show you uh, what this lick is. It is the full melody. It's not terribly long, uh, but once I'm done, I wanna go ahead and explain to you why this works and why you can go away from just strumming chords and play only the melody and it still works. It's actually pretty cool, but first let me go ahead and play it for you. so on and so forth. Uh, this lick is really fun to play. It's really fun to get under your fingers because 
It's a memorable melody. Chances are you are familiar with it already. So getting it under your fingers and getting the timing is actually uh, relatively easy if you have that previous knowledge of the melody. But before I dig into why this lick works, Tac Fam, if you want to learn this note for note, please log in. This is your daily challenge. Log in, click on Start Challenge. That'll take you to the teaching video. Once you're through with that, you can then move to the play along video, adjust it to a speed that's comfortable for you. And don't forget to open up the tab by clicking on that icon in the lower right hand corner. Corner. And if you want to pull up the video right next to the tab, you can absolutely do that. In fact, that's the way that I like to use it because, well, I have both things right in front of me. Okay, so what makes this lick work? Well, number one, I think that the, the elephant in the room, I was gonna say the cat in the bag. It's not the cat in the bag, it's the elephant in the room. What makes this lick work is that you likely know the melody. You play the notes and immediately you can hear it. Even if you don't know the words, you're like, oh, Ain't No Sunshine, that's that Bill Withers song. Furthermore, what makes this lick work is that presence of the bass. It's pulling us through on the rhythmic end of things. You know, so often if you're playing a song and you're just strumming the chords or finger picking the chords and you go to play the melody, all of the momentum of the song drops out. It's gone and you're left with these stark single notes which isn't always bad, but sometimes that's the effect that it has. It's like, hey, wait, where'd the rest of the song go? That's not really the case the way that this melody is played, or rather the way that I showed that you could play this melody, because that bass keeps us going through. It fills out the bottom end, but it also carries this rhythmic momentum. You know, you do the quick little vocal phrase. Let me see, it sounds like this. <laughs> That kind of pulls you along to the next phrase. So you're using the vocal phrase, and then in between vocal phrases, you're actually adding the bass portion to continue the momentum of the song. It's a really cool and fun technique to try, and obviously it works great in this song, but I encourage you to use it in maybe a song that you're trying to learn. See if you can pick out the melody and also incorporate the bass within the spaces, because that'll allow you to break from strumming the guitar, play the melody, and you won't feel like you've necessarily lost anything. A really fun technique to try, and something that I think um, is really a, a, a creative door opener, if you will. Now, before we get back to the show, I do wanna mention one thing, and I think this lick really highlights it. When you're learning something from a song, you, can, you really have two options. You can treat it as just a sole portion of that song, or you can treat it in a more general sense, saying to yourself, okay, I know this is part of that song, but where else can I apply it? Furthermore, if you wanna dig deeper, what are the mechanics that make it work? Because if you start to learn things from that perspective, understanding or trying to figure out where else you can use it, understanding the mechanics that drive the, the thing that you're playing, then all of a sudden you're not just learning one song. You're learning, well, any song that that particular technique shows up in. So I would strongly encourage you to, on your guitar journey, yes, you're gonna be learning songs probably uh, daily. Learn them for what they are, but always ask yourself the question, what makes this tick and where else can I apply it? Because then, by just learning a single song, or what you think you're learning uh, is just a single song, you're really expanding your song repertoire and ultimately your guitar toolbox that will make other songs fall under your fingers that much easier. A couple more nuggets of acoustic news you can use. We're gonna kick things off with just a fun little announcement. On October 27th, there is an album coming out, a tribute to the Judds. And I follow Trey Hensley on Instagram and he posted a picture of Trey Hensley himself, uh, Rob Ikes and Molly Tuttle in the studio. Well, they all together cut a track for this album. Uh, the name of the song they cut is John Deere Tractor and I can't wait to hear it. I cannot wait to hear three of my favorite artists on a single track. I just can't wait and I wanted to share it with you. You can pre-order the album right now. Again, it's out October 27th. If you follow Trey on Instagram, you can certainly go to the link in his bio and I believe there's a pre-order link there. But so cool to hear Molly and Trey uh, on guitar on the same track. I mean, I haven't heard it yet. I think it will be so cool to hear Molly and Trey on the same track. And then of course to have Rob there playing Dobro, I mean, Hell yeah, just hell yeah. Uh, next up is a, fo uh, a folk, next up is, well yeah, I guess he's a folk guitarist. Next up is uh, someone I met at the Fretboard Summit and I had the delight to watch him play, Cameron Noller, uh, Fretboard Journal contributor, but much more than that, just a 
stellar player. I, one of those players you, you listen to and you're like, what, what, really, what can't they do on the guitar? He can flat pick, he can finger pick. And he does so with such taste and such a wonderful touch. Absolute fantastic tone. You know, they say tone is in the fingers. And I think Cameron is a great example of that. Um, he is releasing, I think this is the third generation, the third reissue, I don't know exactly what to call it, of his method book called uh, Guitars Have Feelings Too. I think the subtitle is Method for the Rural Guitarist. Uh, he's taking pre-orders for the physical copy right now, so please go to his website, reach out to him via Instagram and, or all the other socials, and uh, see if you can hop on this, because he does these short runs of this book, and I think it's one you need on your bookshelf. Uh, but if you don't get a chance to pre-order the physical copy, don't worry, he has an ebook uh, on his website, go to the shop, and along with that, he has plenty of other instructional materials. I mean, stuff from Norman Blake, which is an ebook and video tutorials, to uh, underplayed fiddle tunes, to you name it. It's all on there, very interesting stuff, and I have to say, incredibly uh, reasonably priced. And Cameron's a wealth of knowledge, and it shows in his instructional materials, so. Uh, make sure to check that out. A uh, shout out to Cameron. It was a delight to see him play at the Fretboard Summit. Like I said, just a very impactful performance for me personally. And then lastly, we have something from Jake Eddy, who I had a chance to chat to. Bleh. My brain's going way faster than my mouth can. Um, <laughs> the next thing comes from Jake Eddy, who I had a chance to hang out with at the Fretboard Summit. Uh, we shared a, a lot of laughs, and I got to play his, his D28, which was an experience in and of itself. Uh, very generous with his time, very generous with just his enthusiasm for the guitar. You know, he's got this, this vintage D28, and he's just like, yeah, play it. He's like, I want people to play this, because I can't just hold this all for myself. And I just was like, wow, man. You are, you are a guitar dude through and through. Anyways, uh, uh, all that aside, um, I wanted to feature a video that he just posted about playing fast and how he manipulates licks to play fast. Uh, not only is the lick something that is awesome and I think everybody should learn it, but this is something that, there's a philosophy behind it that I think has a much greater impact and one that I want you to hear from Jake's mouth uh, using you know Jake's words. He has a great way of describing how to manipulate bar lines. And I just think he, he nails it. It's very eloquent and very succinct in the way that he describes it. Uh, and on that, uh, well, I'll mention that afterwards. Let's go ahead and look at the video first. Here's one little lick that sort of encapsulates a ton of my ideas about how to play super fast and clean. So the lick sounds like this. Three, four. Now that lick might not sound like much, but I'll show you how fast it can get here in a second. But one of the great things about that phrase that's really helpful when you're playing any phrase really fast is that it starts off with a little push. It kind of jumps the bar line. Listen again. One, two, three, four. So I choose to push it like that because it buys me time to set up for the next phrase. If I were playing that lick at a slow tempo, I might just play three, four. But when it's really fast, I like to jump the bar line, give myself a little time. Three, four. And actually a lot of the things that I play at super fast tempos are sort of outside the bar lines. Maybe I'll get to a chord of eighth note early. Maybe I'll hang on the bar for a quarter note after of a phrase or something like that. And, and that's the thing, I keep those bar lines kind of fluid in my mind. That way I can give myself time to execute licks and think about the next phrase. So now I guess I'll play that uh, lick at like 200 and some thousand beats a minute so you can hear kind of how it sits. For me playing fast kind of just as an ideology, it's about buying time and giving yourself time to execute, giving yourself time to make decisions. And on those fantastic speedy notes, I think it's a great time to wrap up the Acoustic Tuesday show for today. Uh, but before I do so, I just wanna make mention that um, Jake is a wonderful teacher. Yeah, he's a wonderful player and inspiring player, but he is a fantastic teacher. So follow Jake online. He does these homestay programs where folks come to his house and learn. It's kind of an intensive. He does these uh, kind of, uh, I'll call them flat picking getaways where folks uh, meet at a location and he teaches them. He also, a lot of times when he's on tour, will do uh, a couple of lesson spots uh, while he's you know in, in his downtime during the day. So if those opportunities become available for you and they interest you, uh, make sure to, uh, 
well, make sure to seize them because, like I said, he's an awesome, awesome teacher, a wealth of information, and a great perspective on the instrument. So again, on those notes, I think it's a great time to wrap up the Acoustic Tuesday show, but first, we do indeed have to take a sneak peek into next week. And next week, we'll be looking at the Acoustic Tuesday show. We'll call it an Acoustic Tuesday retrospective. I've been thinking about the show. We're coming up on, well, we actually just passed the six-year mark. And I thought it'd be really fun to turn back time and look at some of the highlights throughout the history of the show. Some funny ones, some interesting ones, some off the rails ones. Uh, that's what's happening next week on the Acoustic Tuesday show. Make sure to tune in. You can catch Acoustic Tuesday every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Before I let you go, please do remember this. Your guitar success, however you define it for yourself, is directly related to your guitar routine. So please invest the time in developing your guitar routine and make sure to have fun every single day that you play. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me today. Thank you for being a guitar geek, and I'll see you next Tuesday on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Cheers to you, be nice, and play guitar.